great. So welcome to our second Catalyst Sustainability Goals event, Trees in Cardano, hosted by Cardano for Climate in collaboration with the Cardano and Catalyst communities, and most importantly, you. I'm going to just mute everybody for the moment, so you might have to take yourself off again. Um, there we go. And all right, next slide, please. Our mission is for Cardano to make the world work better for all people, animals, and the planet. Through Cardano for Climate, individuals from across the world are coming together to address humanity's greatest challenge. We support all proposals and projects related to climate change action on Cardano, the blockchain that aims to be energy efficient and environmentally sustainable. Today we ask, how can we use Cardano block blockchain technology to support forest conservation and tree planting activities. What began as a challenge has grown into a community, Cardano for Climate. And I'm going to hand it over to Simon. Thank you, Melanie. So I've been um, facilitating uh, the Cardano for Climate uh, proposal uh, challenge setting. So. Um, I would like to say just a few words uh, about that. And uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone who you know, participated um, directly or indirectly. I think, you know, um, but, and we had really many people join in into the rooms and give their, their ideas and feedback and, and how this uh, should work. But one of, one of my own, um, you know, more, more personal, um, uh, things that are uh, uh, or reasons why, why I did this was because I think that you know it should it should not just be climate change or solving climate change and working against climate change should not be just a hobby and not just be activism and charity it should be like real work and our current uh, or the traditional uh, economy just doesn't you know, support that yet. I mean, uh, there is some, some work going on in the government, but it is just simply too slow. And I think we all agree on that. Um, so the reality is, you know, we're, we're killing the planet. And I mean, in, in the current system, extracting fossil view, view, uh, fuels or overfishing the sea or dumping waste, is financially um, supported. It is, you know, you, you are benefited if you do that financially. You get money for that. So um, this challenge is not just about helping fight climate change. This is about making sure that Cardano is building an economic system, a collaboration system, we could say, that benefits those that uh, do the right thing, like planting trees, even when we have to cut them down to, you know, have paper on which we can write on, or building solar and sustainable energy systems, even when we have to use some fossil fuel to get where we want to get with energy sustainability and cultivating fish and the ecosystem, even when we have to feed on them for our own survival. We need to think two steps further than, than we're doing now uh, and make the damages that we impose on, on the world visible and tangible and you know, help reverse those, uh, th those impact, this impact that we have and benefit, also benefit those that help with that financially. And also nations, they will start you know, taking steps in in the direction of solving climate change. They, they will do it. I mean, I think there's no doubt in my mind that they will do it. Uh, Tesla's success doesn't come from anywhere. It is because climate change is a major problem. The younger generation sees that. The investment sees that. If you look at fossil fuel, uh, the big fossil fuel companies, their market share has gone down in the last years and it will continue to go down. And yes, that is one of the big reasons why this 
challenge is so important because when we can position ourselves, it, it was important for Cardano, not just for the world, but for Cardano specifically, if we can uh, position ourselves as a green blockchain, then we will have it much, much easier in the, in the, in the future. And building those tools now with, with that in mind is going to be so much, so much more beneficial to us. So thank you, everyone. Who, who, whose turn is it now? Who, who can I give the mic up to? Jacob. OK. Uh, Yaram, if I could ask you to just move to the next slide, please, for me. No, it's on Simon. OK, so we've got, uh, we've got the agenda today. We've got some great speakers, and uh, it's a really great lineup. And I think you know um, what uh, what we're going to discuss. Uh, you know the subject, uh, the title of the conference is very simple: uh, trees and Cardano. But how, how beautiful is that? It's uh, you know there, there are so many analogies in what Cardano is uh, has at its heartbeat, and you know the mission it, it's it's uh, supposed to uh, it, it will bring to, to our our world. Um, you know, we've uh, the simple act of, of uh, tree planting uh, is uh, uh, is very fundamental, and uh, <clears throat> there is a special guy who actually dedicated a big chunk of his life to uh, to planting trees, and uh, I'll I'll tell you all about him, and I, I think it's it's fine to dedicate this conference uh, to him. Uh, his name is Vasil Dabov. Uh, he uh, unfortunately he passed away uh, in December last year. Um, he's uh, a great mathematician from Bulgaria, and uh, I have someone um, someone who knew him better than myself to to tell more about him. So if we could go to the next slide, and uh, I'd like you to just take two minutes to to watch this video for me, please. Uh, Vassil Dabov. Uh, Vassil was a very unique man. Uh, he was in his 60s when I met him, and he lived a long, rich life. He was from Bulgaria, uh, and he studied mathematics, and he had a keen interest in algebra and analysis and, and other areas, and he, he was an incredibly brilliant man. Uh, and then somewhere along the way, he developed almost a druid-like passion for nature, uh, and he decided to go on a personal mission to plant thousands of trees, Ginkgo biloba trees, sequoias, all kinds of things. And over his life, planted over 10,000 trees. Uh, he was a fairly unique person and had a very unique perspective on humanity. And uh, he heard my AMAs years ago and said, wow, this Cardano community is something truly special. Uh, so he just started showing up at our events. And eventually we ran into each other at places like Plutus Fest and Edinburgh back in I think it was 2019 and uh, or 2018, and then uh, eventually at the uh, IOHK summit that we did in Miami back in 2019. Uh, and I just enjoyed talking to him so much uh, that I decided that for the second year anniversary of Cardano, that I'd go to Bulgaria and actually spend some time with Vossel and plant some trees. Uh, so in September of the, I think it was 2019, the second anniversary. Uh, we actually flew out to Plodiv uh, and went to the uh, agricultural university there and uh, went ahead and planted a bunch of uh, ginkgo biloba trees and I think a sequoia tree uh, with Vassal and um, his family and uh, a lot of friends there. It was a great event and we really enjoyed it. We uh, just uh, had a chance to talk a lot. Uh, but, you know, I think he represented truly the best of our community. And it was always helpful, always curious, uh, always willing to relate and talk to people. And he carried his heart on his sleeve. And he'd just tell you how he thought the world ought to be and shared a lot of love and peace with people. So farewell, my friend. You were a good one to all of us. And you will be missed. And because of the technology we've built, forever remembered. Cheers. So one part that that video doesn't go into is that the next hard fork on Cardano is going to be in June, not the next one, but the June hard fork is going to be the Dabov hard fork. So 
people ask us why Cardano, it starts from the top. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, with, with no further ado, I think we can officially say that the Trees and Cardano, the first conference of Trees and Cardano is, is officially open. Uh, and uh, I'm sure there'll be a second one uh, after that uh, with the great lineup of, of ideas and projects we have. Um, if we go to the next slide, I would like to hand it over to Duncan from uh, Veritree. Hey, everyone. Um... I'm Duncan Brown. I'm the blockchain engineer at Veritree. Um, just like to check everyone can hear me and see the screen. Great. Um, so I'm here to introduce Veritree. Uh, we are calling or we're building the restorative operating system. Uh, next slide. Our vision is to make saving the planet simple um, as well. Next slide. Uh, it all kind of started in 2008. Um, the founders of Tentree and Veritree were graduating high school and exploring how they could uh, be entrepreneurs that gave back to planet Earth. They were really interested in planting trees, so they spent the summer uh, and built a corporation that planted trees on crown land just outside of Regina. Um, over the summer, they planted about 150,000 trees, um, but during that time, they learned about how, while this is great impact, it isn't going to have as much as they'd hope. Like it isn't going to change the world by starting one tree planting company. So enter 2012, um, and that's when they started Tentree. Uh, Tentree has, has the goal of creating a business model that served as a vehicle to plant trees. So the model is simple, you know, buy once, uh, plant 10 trees. Um, and they grew to an un, you know, unbelievable amount of, uh, of, of reach and sales and it was clear that the, the world really responded well to this business model. And by 2019, they'd actually outpaced their ability to scale the validation and verification of their planting efforts. Um, and that's when they created Veritree. Uh, and so Veritree started in 2019 and it was just a brainchild of Derek, uh, one of the founders, as well as his cousin, Steven. Um, and it started off as kind of a, just an R and D project to explore how blockchain could be served as a, um, almost a time stamping of events that happened in their supply chain as it comes to trees. And they built a, an MVP on Ethereum using IPFS, um, but it didn't really go you know, very far. And uh, I joined in June of 2021, just yet, yeah, just this past June. Um, it's, been, it's been a long time, <laughs> it's been a long six months. Um, however, they were a, a company of about three and we've grown to a company of about 16. Um, since I've been there, we've planted about 15 million trees between Tentree and Bear Tree. Um, so when I started, they were claiming, you know, we've planted 60 million trees over the last 10 years. And within the six months that I've been there, uh, now we're claiming planted 75 million, which is thanks mostly due to the corporate sponsorships that Bear Tree has brought on. So the vision of the company is to plant 1 billion trees by 2030. Uh, next slide, please. So, there really is no Veritree without Tentree. So I'm gonna take uh, a couple of minutes to introduce Tentree uh, just from first the business side and then the community side. Uh, next slide. So as a business, Ver uh, or sorry, oh, I'm falling along on mine. Sorry, um, yeah, so Tentree is providing the products and community uh, to empower individuals to both enjoy and protect nature. And what that means is um, they are not only using um, more eco-friendly materials and exploring how they can improve their manufacturing and supply chain, but also there's this great side of, of planting countries per product uh, sold. Next slide. And Veritree is um, a really exciting opportunity for me personally because as Tentree as a startup had you know, a mission to create a business model where uh, it's a vehicle for planting trees. And Veritree is their attempt to apply that to other businesses. So for me, I've, I've worked in a, a number of startups and I've never been in a company that has been able to apply their dream to other sectors and other companies. And it's really cool for me to be here at, at this time. Uh, next slide. So here, here without further ado, I'll, I'll introduce Tentree. Um, next slide, please. So Tentree at a gl glance has um, grown astronomically since 2012 with 68% year over year. Uh, the majority of their sales have been through e-commerce and they really hit the, 
e-commerce wave at the perfect time, um, marrying a massive social media following with um, this new business model, which is, is more focused on doing good than doing less bad. Um, and to date, they've planted 65 million trees and a target of 1 billion by 2030. Um, and they're the top 10% of B Corp uh, globally with um, top 5% in recertification, which is very important to the founders. And I, I quite admire that um, interest in, in giving back and being certified as B Corp. Uh, next slide. So the community of, of Tentree has um, a couple important points and pillars. It's a growing safe space for bloggers. Um, I'm not sure if, if you remember in Earth Day 2018, they had a uh, one click equals one tree planted post that reached about 16 million um, people. It's the uh, one of the top 10 biggest Instagram posts ever. It's the, been called the world's most sustainable post. Um, and it's it's framed in the office, actually. It's, it's pretty crazy <laughs> to have engaged that many people and, and then you know planted that many trees. Um, and the really cool point that I'd like to uh, focus on is, is they have 750,000 tree codes registered. So each tree code is, is 10 trees and that's um, attached to the, the uh, price tag of an of a article of clothing, whether it's shipped to you or purchased at a, at a store. So that means that 750 or 7.5 million trees have been registered through the 10 tree platform which um, if you've been following is 10% of the total planted trees between the both companies. So without too much effort into focusing on the, um, the registration and verification of the trees, clearly the market is asking for some sort of tool set where they can go validate where the trees are planted, that they have been planted and that, um, you know, that they're actually doing what they say that they're doing. Um, next slide, please. So without further ado, talk about Veritree. Um, next slide. So the problem that Veritree is, is focusing on is, is the question, questionable ownership in the tree planting and um, reforestation um, corporate side. Uh, there's also the fragmented landscape of, um, of, of the actual land being reforested. Uh, there's little to no transparency um, involved with record keeping or reporting when it, when when the corporate is accounting for the trees that they've planted, um, there's really no reliable data. It's mostly paper, um, if not on the back of a napkin, it's you know in, in the body of an email with maybe some photos of the of the actual site. There's very little marketable, marketable content. Um, Tentree has pressured its planting partners to send them planting photos from the site to you know validate that they've done what they've said they've done, but we really have no way to know that three other companies haven't been sent those same photos. And with that, there's permanence concerns. So um, if Tentree is to go out of business or Veritree is to go out of business, we would lose all of the planting data and re land restoration data that they you know, have in their, um, under their care, um, which, which is one of the reasons that I think blockchain is an absolutely perfect solution for um, more of a global focus and a, uh, um, next slide, I'll, I'll introduce that further. So our solution at Ver Veritree at a glance is, um, oh. so we're collecting data in a closed loop system, which means um, all the data that we're publishing to the blockchain is validated and verified by us, um, which is not in line with the open source community, but I think it's it's step one in building tools for people to um, accept planting data as a as a metric. Um, we allow for real time tracking, which um, we're exploring even further by uh, developing ground sensors and um, and increasing the time that we upload and sync planting data from the field. We've, we're building on blockchain, um, which ensures transparency and accountability. Um, so as the data is ingested from the ground, we collect it on a, a proprietary Android application. Um, so we sent a whole bunch of Samsung phones to the, to the field. Um, most of these environments are, are low to no network environments. So while the planting data is recorded uh, on this device and we capture photos uh, to validate the you know, timestamp and GPS location, uh, all of that can't actually be synced with the cloud until we have the, uh, the, the site manager come with a tablet and sync each device via Bluetooth 
And um, so this manager has, you know, hundreds of kilometers of area to cover. So he goes around to each planting site about once a month and will collect all the planting data on those phones. And if he misses it, you know, he can come around the next month and, and we'll get more. All of that data is then ingested through our cloud um, system. The first set of verification is that is that field manager, the person who's actually on the ground and can validate that the, the square square mileage or, or actual field has been planted. Um, the next step is for the NGO to sign off on all the, the data that they're submitting to our platform. And then from there, we publish it to uh, Arweave. And um, Arweave is a little known um, blockchain project where they provide immutable data storage. And um, it's at the fraction of a cost of the cost of uh, spinning up your own infrastructure. It's extremely accessible. And when we publish data to Arweave, we get a, a publicly viewable URL that we can then put in the metadata on Cardano. And now that token points to the field update um, that we ingested. So we're hoping to build this holistic ecosystem where each token, although fungible, um, will have unique uh, you know, point of existence or, or record of, um, of origin. Next slide, please. And this is where we, the Cardano Forest enters the uh, enters the chat. Um, so I was approached by Jeremy Furster in in about in you know sometime this summer, and he had presented a deck to me that uh, Cardano had created internally, which was to do with the Cardano Forest. And um, it's it's kind of a crazy series of events that led us to um, to basically present the exact same thing to each other. I came to the meeting to present how Veritree could tokenize trees and publish them to the Cardano blockchain. He came to Veritree saying how he could Cardano block blockchain could tokenize trees and, and publish them on the blockchain. Um, so it was a really great you know, meeting, is a meeting of minds. And at first we wanted to plant 10 million trees, but we'd really had no um, evidence that, that we could hit that or how long it would take. So we, we thought we'd start with a, a smaller, more tangible 1 million trees and see you know, how long that took for the the whole ecosystem to, to consume them all. And it, it took about uh, just over three months, which is absolutely amazing. And um, I wanna thank everyone who contributed to it. Like from the bottom of my heart, it was a real success and probably the best way I could have uh, come back from, from Christmas is a you know, full Cardano forest and everything sold out. So th thank you everyone that supported us um, through that. Next slide, please. Just some comparative metrics. Um, I live in Vancouver. Um, so we're planting 1,000,000 trees, which is approximately 250 acres, uh, just almost, uh, you know, just over half of Stanley Park. And um, it's about 63 square blocks, which is about the size of the West End in Vancouver. Um, it's in a huge amount of area and it's going to be absolutely beautiful. Um, next slide. So our solution for the Cardano Forest um, uh, is is it's the Veritree tokens um, as well as NFTs and, and collectible um, donation records or collectible NFTs as well as a donation record which has which will have future utility um, and then we are um, exploring and building the idea of having a, a metaverse forest experience which will allow the owners of the forest to interact with um, these trees in a in a whole new way the um, the Cardano Forest over the next 25 years using you know the conservative internal metrics which is uh three mangroves to one carbon one metric ton of carbon sequestered over 25 years um is expected to sequester 334,000 tons of carbon um and i'm not a climate scientist but um that that's absolutely absurd like that is you know astronomical and i think i think we can still do better but it's um that would make the uh the cardano blockchain um uh, about carbon neutral about 10 times over, I believe. Um, so if you could just click, there's a little animation. I'd also like to let everyone know that the, uh, the first redemption day will be on February 15th, <laughs> 2020, oh, um, back, yeah, it's 2022. So we're, we're gonna have 100,000 trees to redeem on February 15th, 2022. And in that redemption, um, you can collect uh, a Cardano tree if you, purchased over 500 trees. Um, we have a unique lineup of, um, oh, awesome. It's quite a coincidence. Um, 
we have a unique lineup of you know cur curated Cardano trees that are based on the Kenya project that we'll be dropping with these um, with with the uh, donation records. And a donation record um, is your record of impact. We're exploring how we can design future utility into that um, to that NFT. But right now, it will have your uh, your custom amount of trees. So if you trade in twenty five trees, we'll have twenty five trees. I'll have the, the the closest badge or tier that we've um, uh, brought into this whole thing, and then uh, it'll have area reforested, uh, carbons captured, and um, and the GPS coordinates of the field update and where your trees live. Um, so we're hoping to get a good range of of uh, groups and tiers redeeming, and um, yeah, so looking forward to that. Um, I hope everyone goes and swaps their tokens. We're gonna have uh, ideally three to five more, um, depending on the tree uh, planting rate. We're never gonna issue tokens unless the trees are actually in the ground. Um, so just bear with us over this time period. We'll get all the million, 1,000 tree, uh, trees planted and tokens distributed. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just gonna give uh, a couple more slides uh, to look at our internal um this is our platform and software and it's not directly open to the public so i'll just show you kind of what we what we offer our corporate partners um so the partner portal is a it's a destination for everyone to um to see their impact of their, their company so internally it tells you uh, how many trees have been planted um, what percentage of your goal you've achieved um how how much how many hours of work that has allowed the local community to, to have um as well as uh you know food produced and lives impacted so these metrics can be used for internal sustainability um, or uh, any sort of you know internal projects but we also have um next slide we also have the uh company forest oh i'm sorry i didn't have the that's coming up that's the next one so this is the this is more on the partner portal um here's the stretch goals of uh your trees and which which campaigns you're supporting so we have you know four different campaigns um these are these are just you know filler data but we have campaigns in in canada during planting season um in africa all over the the whole year uh, in indonesia as well as south america and we give the partners that we work with the option to choose how many trees they want to plant in which area and which um, impacts those areas have on the local communities. So for some companies, it's really important to um, have you know, more food production or focus on the food production that trees can offer. Um, and other companies just want to have you know, carbon sequestered. It's, it's various, but we want to cater to every, every different brand's unique needs. Um, the uh but what we what we do across all of our planting sites and we make sure to do this is we only we only employ local communities to do the planting work um and this is something that has completely um turned me on to the whole way that we we the whole uh process that veritree follows we only employ uh local community members and through that we're supporting them um and their growth of the tree of the forest so if the local community doesn't see the forest as a source of income or a source of food or a source of um, something, they're going to, to cut down the trees because the logs, the logging uh, companies or, or the, you know, the timber is more important to them or more valuable to them than the trees are. So it's very important to create a ecosystem or economy coming from that forest um, for the local community. So what I have been focusing partially on is how we can create a tree insurance from staking rewards or how we can support um, local community members to, um, you know, explore the forest to further validation, take more photos. Like we're going to have um, all of these activities as beneficial um, actions that we would directly pay that local community member with crypto through. So. Uh, we're exploring how we can almost use a DeFi like scenario to further support the community and the forest growth. Um, and last slide. This is the um, this is a summary of a planting site. So this is the Mahabana planting site, and it just gives you further KPIs and, and impact metrics to further explain 
you know, how we're, we're uh, really changing that community and how we're really just like following through with the promises that we're making of planting trees. Because at the end of the day, there's so few opportunities to, um, to get that data from the ground. So with that data, we think we can make a really exceptional experience for everyone that's you know, coming through to either Veritree or to Tentree or any of our partner brands. Um, we don't want it to just be like, oh, you know, oh, it's great that we're planting trees, but we want to educate people on what that means for the local communities, what that means for, you know, the, the regions and, and the greater country and, and how it like really will change the world through, um, through changing business models and, and giving back. Um, so I think that's the last slide, um, but thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Um, thank you, Dan. Can those... Uh... <clears throat> really, really cool to to see, uh, you know, the history and uh, where, where you guys are at. Uh, we're going to have some uh, some questions. I'm sure everybody will have questions, and we've got a breakout room for you guys uh, at the end of this uh, of this panel. Um, so um, yeah, we have got uh, a couple of more speakers, and I'm just checking with Rob if uh, uh, he's okay with us. Uh, I appreciate uh, Rob is undergoing uh, uh, a COVID infection, as most of us uh, are. So, uh, so basically, uh, Rob, if you want to go, if you want to jump in, I know you're you're stretched for time as well, and so I Actually, think the location is quite uh, upset as well. The, the the situation is a lot better for some reason. Um, I sweated it out last night, and I woke up uh, as if nothing had happened. I don't know what happened, but so I'm all good. And the next nice thing was that I had canceled almost anything on my agenda, so I have time enough. Oh, so fantastic. Go ahead, how you, how you like. So we stick to our agenda. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, next on, if you can have next slide, please. We're going to go to NFC Seed. Hi there. Can everybody Hello. hear me? Very do we, yeah. Hi, how are you? It's nice to see you guys all. Uh, this is my first time chatting with you guys here, uh, but far from first time chatting with a lot of people online. Um, I'm Doobie from NFT Seed, and we're a uh, very small, um, very much of a niche project that's happening on the Cardano um, blockchain. Uh, we're an NFT-based project, and uh, we really wanted to be able to bring something very unique um, to the people here. Um, NFTs, if you're not familiar, are non-fungible tokens. And this is a very fast-paced industry um, where there's incredibly volatile fluctuations in market value of these digital assets. Um, and we wanted to bring a flavor that was very slow and steady um, and be much like the tortoise in the environment. We didn't want to focus on something where there was enormous growth and then enormous fallout. Uh, we really wanted to create something that was long-term. Um, and so you can go next slide. First and foremost, I wanted to just chat about how we can incentivize the preservation of forests and ecosystems. Um, and we can do this in a number of different ways. I just put down four points, but there's uh, a thousand points that we can go through. Um, first and foremost is uh, creating unique and engaging projects um, and really focusing on ones that deliver value. And so uh, how, how, what I mean by that is um, to be able to bring something that it can be done before, um, but we really want people to be able to touch in with it and see themselves, see their own reflection and see nature's reflection in the things that we do. Um, how we can continue to deliver value is in a number of ways. Um, we're able to create things um, of, of value which they can actually exchange in the future. Um, so like Duncan had just mentioned about, um, it, you'll be able to redeem 500 of those barrier trees at, for a Cardano tree, for example. Um, this is direct value that people can see um, and it's a, it's a tangible outcome. 
um, which people can use to create or collect a new digital asset. Um, they could theoretically create a asset in real life with this. Um, and and when, I mean, when I say asset, bear with me. Um, I, I come from a business background, but I also come from uh, a very deep permaculture and farming background. Um, and so I see assets and profit as a, a tree is an asset. Um, uh, an apple from an apple tree is a profit or a yield. Um, and, and so uh, to get back to that analogy with, um, you know, we can create very real world assets with these two where people can purchase these tokens and have a tree planted in real life. Um, they can be able to refer to that token and see the exact story of all of that species. Um, they can see the evolution and the growth of that forest and continue to interact with that over its lifetime. Um, I'll continue to move, I suppose. Um, we wanna be able to provide mutual and profitable opportunities. Um, I, I focus on mutual opportunities because I've been involved in a number of different um, arrangements in life where it wasn't a mutual relationship. And when I've been in that space, someone always benefits to an uneven or an unbalanced um, fashion. And I don't think that anybody's really interested in following forward um, on that type of trajectory into the future. We all want to be eye to eye on a level playing field where locals around the world are being paid fairly for their efforts, um, where they're valued um, in the time that they're contributing to something, um, where they have uh, enough time to spend with their family, uh, to socialize, to um, engage in politics, engage in education, um, you know, fun activities, um, and, and the so forth. Um, and then on profitable, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I, I come from quite a deep farming and permaculture background. And so I tend to see everything in how can I stack functions? Um, and when I say stacking of functions, um, I mean, uh, let's look at this apple tree again. Um, I, I could grow an apple tree and just look at it for the apples that it gives me. Um, but if I start to put different lenses on, then I can realize, well, this apple tree can can actually provide um, some really beautiful uh, wood that I can use for smoking um, the fish that I raise. Uh, or, you know, actually I could, when the, when the tree's old enough, um, I can even uh, utilize this for creating carpentry projects and, and, you know, beautiful cabinets or wonderful instruments. Um, this apple tree is creating habitat for everything that's in my environment. Um, and so when we're creating these um, opportunities, if we can have an abundance of opportunities all within each variable of the equation, um, that is insurmountable profit. Um, I, I should warn, uh, I'm an empath and I really do feel, um, I really feel deeply with nature. And uh, so I, some emotions might flow through me and um, bear with it and, and know that it's my blessing. Um, and uh, in the next um, is to really develop like heart and information-based experiences. Um, and, and what I mean with that is this is how people really connect to things. Um, you know, we, there's this classic, um, I won't name any names, but there's, uh, if we look at how non-government organizations for a long time have advertised to the public, um, they pull on the heartstrings very deeply. Um, if you look at um, certain projects for Africa, you constantly see, um, you know, the, the, the bloated stomach, um, the malnourished child, the flies in and out of the eyes. And I, I respect, um, you know, putting out what is happening and how it is. Um, but I, hope is what really kindles a flame beneath us, inspires us to make something new, to make something change. And to be quite frank, I'm really tired of being scared into doing something. I, I, I don't want to necessarily have to change climate uh, or, or change our approach with climate change to uh, based out of uh, a, a fear-based um, motivation. I want to be really excited to make that happen. Um, and so if I can focus on these things that um, are breathing inside of my heart and that are pumping inside of the hearts of all of us around, um, 
then we can really connect to that. And when our hearts are beating in a synced up pace, it is insurmountable the amount of things that we can accomplish. Um, it, nothing can get in our way. And that's what's really exciting about working in um, blockchain, for example, um, because it is on the foundation of decentralization. Not all chains are, but many of them are. Um, and Cardano was one of the first to reach you know, the, the, the most decentralized format, entirely decentralized format that's out there. Um, so when we can beat with our hearts and we can see and engage with something based on that, that true passion level, it's win-win. It's really beautiful. And then when we can marry that with, with information, with, with science, with research, with um, true strong foundation, um, then, then it, everything can click and everyone can work together. Uh, we, can, we can bring the sharpest of minds to a project. We can bring the most creative and artistic folk um, to weave and create something that is, um, is truly, truly amazing for absolutely everyone that's out there. Um, and finally on this screen, uh, to really deliver interactive creations. And so these are things where we can touch them, we can see them, we can, we can experience the evolution and the growth chain of what we are actually building and creating. Um, cryptocurrency, when it first started out, um, you know, I kind of started getting involved in 2013 and it was interesting in terms of like, we got to control a lot of the finances on our own. Um, we got to move these things around on our own. We didn't have to work with a bank in there. But then it got quickly boring. Like it, there was a lot of movement in the industry, but it got boring. And then as um, we started to create new protocols that we could interact with cryptocurrency with, um, when non-fungible tokens started to come out or NFTs, um, then all of a sudden, things started to come to life. It wasn't just my money that was existing in a space, um, but I could actually start to vote with my money. I could put my money where my mouth was and have that turn into something that really blossomed and grew. And so delivering these inter interactive creations are extremely important um, to be able to, to grow with people, engage with people and keep them connected to a project. And so I, th this doesn't necessarily touch to how can this preserve a forest ecosystem, but read between the lines here. This is, this is the, um, the, the framework um, or, and the rubric that I am approaching this with to enable people to um, engage with creating new forests, to create new ecosystems, um, and how I'm delivering that through NFT seeds. So next slide, please. Um, and here we can see there's there's a couple different realms that I wanted to touch on, um, and uh, I, I wanted to like kind of look at how we can utilize NFTs or non fungible tokens to connect with things in the real world. And so there's there's there's, a, there's two kind of main paths here that I wanted to touch on, um, where there's non fungible tokens and fungible tokens, uh, and, and I'll just help with a little de uh, definition of these at the start. Um, a non fungible token is something that we can't really. Um, it's not a liquid asset, so it's not something that I could necessarily transact for a sandwich at a store. Um, but a fungible token is, it has a common basis of value um, and I could utilize that. Uh, so like my fiat currency to, to purchase something from the store. Um, and so in non-fungible tokens, uh, really the sky is the limit in terms of what we can deliver with these things, how we can connect them with the real world. Um, and I guess actually legalities are, are also a limiting factor at the moment. We're, we're, we're struggling to keep up with how fast this industry is moving, but it's coming and, and we're moving into that. Um, and, and so right off the hop, um, NFTs can deliver memberships. And so, for example, like this group that we have here, if we were all to hold a, um, a, a common NFT um, that would give us membership into the space, um, it could allow us to enter into a meeting space or deny us from entry into a meeting space. Um, it could allow us to participate in town halls uh, or deny certain people as well. 
um, it, it's also really interesting in terms of um, creating a fashion of governance. Um, and so we can utilize uh, voting protocols calls um, through non-fungible tokens as um, the mechanism to again validate does this person have the the, the clout or the status or the qualifications uh, to actually make a vote in what we're talking about at this given time um, and, we, and uh, fungible tokens can also be utilized for that. Um, what, what Cardano does in a number of ways, they ask you to vote with your actual money um, or upcoming uh, de decentralized finance protocols ask you to vote with your, uh, your ADA as well. And so you can stake with their um, stake pool operators um, and have that count as a, as a vote for their protocol. Um, it, it, we can also create assets and we can back those assets up. Um, and so again, like as Duncan had mentioned um, in that uh, like Cardano trees are these things that have a coordinate to the actual tree itself. Um, and so you can have this, um, this piece that is um, a digital piece of art, but it's actually connected to something in real life, a, a tree that's growing out there as well. Or the Veritree tokens, um, which are fungible tokens, but they're connected to a real tree that's in real life too, or a grouping of trees that are in in the real as well. Um, and then something that's really kind of on the emergence is education. And this is gonna be uh, a, an absolutely massive space. Um, all of these will be, um, but education can be served in a number of different ways um, as well through these NFTs. And it can give us, um, like a, an NFT could be um, your, your ticket into um, an upcoming seminar or a course. Um, it can be a, uh, your actual course load. Um, and so there's ways to be able to integrate um, full books into the back end of a, of a non-fungible token. So you can, you can call that up um, from wherever you are, or you can share that with someone else um, because you own the rights to it. Um, you, you can integrate in um, like digital based education as well, um, where you can step into a space and be fully immersed in it. Um, and so like a, a, an area that I'm very interested in is how um, we can create educational programs that are based on um, reforesting, uh, that are based on um, strategic uh, landscape developments and design. Um, and be able to lead people through that step by step, but then bring them right into the environment so they can be fully surrounded in how those working functions are. Um, they can see it play out uh, step by step and see the evolution um, of how a, a swale would work in real life or why you Do would we? have a benefit. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt you. When we get on these roles, it's kind of like, wow, there is so much that you have to talk about and so many things that I'm connecting to. Mm. And I noticed you have more slides. We're going to, can we take the rest of your presentation to a breakout room shortly um, and continue sure. on with people that are interested in the NFTs? Because um, I know my friend Dawn that's here, there's a few other people that would really like to get deeply into this. Um, and we're, we're feeling a little bit of a time crunch um, at the moment. We've got Rob coming in from Brazil and he's, um, he's got somewhat limited time, but, um, and a few other things to go through. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, awesome. It was amazing, uh, Duby, by the way. But if you want to close or do some kind of few more minutes just to, yeah. What? Well, uh, the message, the heart, the you know the the feeling, all of that you passed incredibly. So that's uh, amazing. Uh, sure. Well, let me. I, I haven't even introduced what an NFT seeds is. So let me mm. just briefly touch on that. Um, Please, sir. So I think that that'll be the next slide there. Yeah. Let me. I'm going to show my screen here now. Mm -hmm. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, Doobie. It's like wow. Um, would love to keep going and going, but we promised that we would try and keep this to two hours. And I think, uh, um, yeah. And and Tyler's going, did we cut Doobie off before he started talking about NFT swales? I'm gonna actually gonna make a few people mad for cutting you off, honestly. 
because you have so much information. So let's carry that to the breakout room and please forgive me, everybody. I've got a little okay. bit of pressure from a few other unnamed people. <laughs> you see my screen? Do you see the yeah. screen? Okay. Yeah, this is good. I'll keep it very brief. Uh, yes, so so my, my, my background is in tech industry. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur as well. Uh, from there, I, about eight years ago, I got really keen in permaculture design uh, and really on fire with gardening. Um, from there, I started setting up plant nurseries all around the world, predominantly in Africa as well as in Canada. Um, and, I decide, and I really focused on creating uh, forest systems um, that focused on uh, developing fodder, fuel, fiber uh, that could all be utilized in a number of different areas. I got tired of waiting for corporate sponsors to come alongside me to empower and to move certain things forward. And so it's okay. And so what I decided to do was to set up NFT seeds as a way that we could uh, connect with consumers to see, are they willing to pay for a digital asset um, that is, is tied to their heart and that is tied to a project that um, could make big changes into the future. And, uh, and so that is what NFTC did, is it was a proof of concept to connect with community, um, to be able to create a uh, foundation that was lucrative for ourselves um, so that we wanted to make projects happen. We didn't have to ask for funding or anything like that. We just went ahead and did it. So. Thank you very much for your time. So if you're taking up too much time and uh, I really wish, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, no, I'm sorry we're, for that. We're going to have you as a main speaker next time. And then maybe at one of our meetups too, right? Oops. Sorry guys, I'm just adjusting my microphone here. Um, and I lost my screen. There we are. Here we go. Sorry about that. Okay, yeah. So here we go. I'm. Uh, my name is Peter Van Garderen. I'm in Vancouver, Canada, and I'm the founder of the Tree Dano Project, and we're an innovative Cardano native approach to forest conservation. Um, so we've just heard some great presentations from Duncan, um, from Duby about um, innovative approaches that Tree Dano echoes as well and um, builds off of as well. So um, just hold on a second. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to Rob's talk. Hopefully he comes back because I think uh, originally I was the, this presentation was gonna go after Rob's talk, which talks a lot about the importance of uh, forest conservation, which is Triano is, is squared aimly at. Um, because there are an estimated 3 trillion mature trees remaining in the ground around planet Earth today. And we need to keep as many of those there as possible. And with your support, that's what Triano will do. Next slide, please. So, Existing large trees provide a powerful sense of psychological and spiritual well being to all of us. Everyone here can think of at least one tree that is special to them. Mature trees anchor ecosystems and they provide homes for an incredibly wide diversity of plant and animal species. They also prevent soil erosion and related landslides. Most importantly, peer reviewed research studies have proven that the rate of tree carbon accumulation increases continuously with tree size. Next slide. However, in the excitement and buzz around planting new trees. Can you forward the next slide, please, Jacob? Maybe not. That's gonna be your own. Yeah, this one is Thanks, fine. Jerome. That's the next slide, thank you. Um, so what I wanted to say is that there's a lot of excitement and buzz around uh, planting new trees and, and, and definitely needed and important and uh, bear tree is a great example of that in our community. Um, but in the buzz around that, uh, conserving existing trees can often be overlooked or downplayed. Um, so there's no doubt that planting new trees when done correctly is critical to restoring damaged ecosystems and increasing carbon sequestration. But these seedlings will take decades to reach the full carbon capture value of the trees we already have. But even worse, despite all the easily recognizable types of value that big trees have, their monetary worth can only be realized if you cut them down and sell them as lumber. Next slide. Fortunately, there's an emerging methodology called natural capital accounting that looks to change that. It provides a systemic way to assign monetary value to ecological assets, including existing trees of all species. Last March, the United Nations ratified an internationally recognized standard for this innovative new way to recognize the true economic value of our natural world, similar to what Dubi was talking about earlier. 
Giordano has adopted the UN's SEEA standard as the basis for minting NFTs for mature trees on the Cardano blockchain. Each real world large tree can now be represented with a unique verifiable digital equivalent <clears throat> on the Cardano blockchain. Giordano is also a pioneer in adopting trustworthy permanent archival storage on a fully decentralized Web3 platform for all the NFT supporting documentation. And we're using Arweave as well, like Veritree. It uses a truly fully decentralized platform that meets legal requirements for digital evidence. And this is where I've applied my own 20 years industry experience as a digital archivist and some groundbreaking technology that we're developing in the Project Catalyst funded OrcFax Oracle project. Next slide. So Tridano uses satellite imagery to inventory large batches in specific ecosystems, in, sorry, large batches of trees in specific ecosystems in both private and public plots of land. We're starting with pilot projects in British Columbia, Canada. On private property, landowners use the Trudano DAP to verify the existence of their live trees. Trudano syncs with legal cadaster maps and land title registry records, which are represented as W3C compliant verifiable credentials. These are managed from a secure decentralized identifier wallet within the app. The owners of the private lots of land are issued Trudano NFTs and fractionalized tokens to reward them for conserving the trees on their land. In British Columbia's vast publicly owned provincial parks, our DAP user volunteers will pin the mother, mother anchor trees within each ecosystem identified by Tridano satellite scans. These take topography and natural boundaries into account rather than drawing arbitrary polygons. The NFTs for these publicly owned trees are assigned to the Tridano treasury and the DAP users are awarded Tridano tokens for the pinning work. The continued existence and health of Trudano NFT records, out of trees, sorry, will be verified once a year by a combination of the satellite imagery and the on the ground DAP users, who are then further rewarded with Trudano tokens for each verification action. Next slide. When a tree is pinned and added to the system via the smartphone camera and GPS, Trudano uses artificial intelligence to identify the species and display information about it to the user from its knowledge base. These types of features draw inspiration from the iNaturalist app, which has proven that education leads to conservation. Again, something that was mentioned by Doobie earlier. Trudano also includes a social network to share photos, videos, hikes, and leaderboards to gamify the inventorying experience and celebrate the hard work of underground users who may have to confront some hardy backcountry to reach all the unmapped plots. We are looking to crowdsource and apply the network effect to tree conservation. Of course, the fact that Trudano tokens will be tradable on Cardano's DEXIS also adds a non-trivial monetary incentive. Next slide. The Trudano treasury will use early stage seed funding to launch its own Cardano stake pool. The ADA staking rewards will provide the initial money supply to fund the tokens for the, initial, for the pilot projects. Then the UN SEEA natural capital accounting formas, formulas will be applied to offer the Trudano stock of conserved trees on open carbon offset markets. This will significantly scale the investment in the treasury and allow the project to go global beyond its initial British Columbia pilots. There is pent up corporate and investment fund demand for carbon offsets and Trudano offers an innovative, credible alternative to tree planting projects, which of course also deserve equal investment. It's important to note that Trudano NFTs are not tradable. The NFTs themselves are not. They are a proof of ownership and form the basis of issuing fractionalized Trudano tokens from them. These will be tradable on Cardano DEXs and may increase or decrease in value according to market demand. If the annual verification actions prove that trees have been removed, burned, or died, their NFTs will be burnt and destroyed, and no further Trudano tokens will be issued against them. There's potentially a lot of money at stake in the new green economy of conservation and reforestation. Trudano's mission is to save as many of the remaining 3 trillion mature trees that are remaining in the ground and not to get caught up in profit potential. We have an aggressive roadmap to move project governance of the treasury, stake pool, and technology maintenance to a fully decentralized autonomous organization within a year of production launch to make this a people's movement with the high quality research, free open source software technology infrastructure, and community decision making needed for success. Next slide. So if this, any of this interests you, please come and check out our website at tridano.earth for more information. It includes a newsletter sign up and links to our Twitter and Facebook accounts so that you can follow our progress. If you are a registered Project Catalyst voter, then we really need your support to accelerate the implementation of the Tridano solution. You can find our proposal in the DAPS integration challenge. Please vote for us. Um, and yeah, that's it. I'm hosting a QA session after the presentations and I'd be happy to tell you more there. Thank you.
beautiful, Peter. Absolutely beautiful. Um, very hopeful in our hope to um, preserve old growth forests. Over to you, Jacob. Hmm. That was a great story, actually. Uh, I, I, I did enjoy it. And I think, you know, the the trees tell the story, uh, tell stories, and we should, we should follow the trees. Um, and uh, I think uh, we might have Rob. Yeah, Rob is back. Can you give him, Rob, you're here? Hi, sorry, I had to step out for a minute. And uh, what I saw from Pete was very, uh, very interesting. So I hope I can go through the slide deck later. Beautiful. Ja, heel okay. mooi. Bedankt, Rob. Dat zullen we zeker doen. <laughs> Oké, okay, Rob, I think you should be able to share your screen now. Ja, yeah. um... yeah, please share your screen. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm I'm pretty excited about this cool community led um, what's going on here. Uh, yeah, we're yeah. not professionals, we're not experts at this, but just the way it's coming together and happening, I'm I'm really hopeful for 2022. We got it. Perfect. So hi everybody. Um I just got to know about Cardano um, and, and the blockchain adventures a few days ago. Actually, what really triggered me was uh, is, is, the, is the brave battles at uh, Ferry Creek that uh, even here from the Brazilian rainforests are noticed. Uh, and um, I also think it's uh, incredibly important what's happening there. And yes, we need to regenerate the forest and we need to replant. But first and foremost, we need to keep the forests standing that are there. Um, while what I will show you has a lot to do with blockchain, it's like what the transformator is to TV. So um, I, in that sense, it is uh, without it, you can't have it, but I'm not going into the details on how blockchain would be uh, a part of this, except for some small details. In fact, this is a sort of an umbrella story um, that is much larger. And I think we're all part of the same um, journey and the same um, changing narrative is that I think all of us are clear that um, if we do not turn around the way humanity is operating within this decade, our kids are toast and the other life forms that are on this earth are toast. So the plan I'm giving here is a very umbrella uh, kind of plan, which is, it's, as you can see, it says, let's cool the planet. You know, the whole climate change story is all about slowing down the heating of the planet. Actually, that's ridiculous. At 1.2, especially in the tropical areas, uh, people get whipped uh, already and the ice sheets are melting and the boreal forests are, are burning. And the permafrost frosts are, are, are melting. And it's, uh, we, so we're already in a vicious circle. The Amazon rainforest is near collapse. And uh, so basically we're already on the way out unless we forcefully change our course. Well, this is actually just the same story, 50 years of talk and um, basically no change of direction. Which uh, well, I think there's this uh, English saying uh, that uh, the road to hell, uh, to hell is paved uh, by good intentions. I think the first thing I want to mention is that we need to have um, a Copernican change of how we look at our planet, not in the mechanical view that is emanating from the past uh, industrial revolution and science framework. We are part of the largest living being alive. As our bodies are is made up of cells and all kinds of parts that make us what we are, we are part of a much larger living being. and We better get used to it because we're hurting her. The solutions are all so much less complicated if we start to think about working with nature. And here there's a story that I'd like to um, uh, give in a short run because um, one of the 
points in the climate narrative that is going completely wrong, that all the focus is on CO2. Now, CO2 is a problem, and I won't deny it. And yes, we have to uh, do something about it. All fair. The energy transition needs to go on. The, the econ economy has to be circular, but we are forgetting the elephant in the room that the planet has taken hundreds of millions of years to create cooling capacity, to really create cooling organs. And those are the forests. And the heating of the planet is only partially through CO2, although 100% or almost, except for methane, is attributed to CO2. But maybe as much as half or more is actually caused by the destruction of forests. And it's not told by the IPCC. A forest, forest um, cool in several ways. OK, the carbon sequestration, we all know. But we all, what we don't realize is that forests create rain. And when they create rain, they actually transport the heat from condensation uh, that is, uh, that is um, from, from water vapor into condensation. Heat gets dissipated, but it's basically transported out through the higher uh, atmosphere and out into um, space. The second one is that um, forests make clouds and clouds have albedo. Quite often you hear that dark forests decrease the reflectivity of the, of, uh, the planets, but healthy um, forests actually do create clouds, especially at the hottest times of the day. There's more ways in which forests are cool, but what I could say is that the total cooling capacity of an intact, healthy primal forest might be five or more times than what they think it can do in terms of carbon sequestration. So the elephant in the room is that we don't understand, but we should understand that forests cool, and with forests we can cool the planet. This is a quick uh, thing to understand that the biotic pump actually uh, uh, of forests actually creates flying rivers, uh, and um, uh, and those rivers are very crucial to um, uh, to irrigate the inside of continents because otherwise the water would start st stay near near the coast. But when you when you cut coastal forests, then basically you fall, you make the biotic pump in the flying river. You you slow it down and you you break it. And you see there's a couple of here. Um, I'm mostly interested in the one in the Amazon, but you can also see that actually the um, the rainforest of uh, British Columbia and uh, the the west coast of the United States are very crucial to do the whole rain uh, event of, uh, of of Canada and North America. I won't uh, take too much time. Uh, because um, uh, we don't have that. But anyway, I would like to say that the Amazon rainforest is by far the most powerful, and you have to see it as an, a planetary organ that has created its own weather system and that, does, uh, that regulates the hydrocarbon and oxygen cycles all of the same, um, and we need to understand it as an organ of our living planet. So this I've already said, I'm just going through a pre presentation that's a bit too long for now. But what I want to say is that I think if we look at the whole climate narrative a little bit different, we can throw ourselves a life boy and get ourselves out of the mess we're in. The first one, as I said, is that the combination of forests and how forests play with the, with the hydro cycle is a way to cool the planet. It can be it can be financed by CO2 sequestration because the whole world is uh, right now uh, completely hot about uh, carbon credits. So let's make use of that. It says here the use of modern technology and their blockchain comes in. Um, I'll come to that later. And my solution especially is that we actually start paying hundreds of millions in the global south to regenerate their own lands, which in many cases were destroyed by colonialism. So what's to do? First of all, I thought it was a typo when they said at COP26 that there would be a, a moratorium on uh, cutting forests by 2030. I thought it would have been by 30 November of, the, of last year. So we have to push for that. The second one is we need a Marshall Plan to regenerate 1 billion of hectares, which is roughly the size of Canada or the United States or China. Uh, and um, 
regenerate that nature because um, with that, we will start cooling the planet. It has the largest effect in the tropics because simply the bio uh, activity is highest there because of the amount of sunlight that's coming in. And of course, we need to uh, integrate this with new forms of agriculture, um, which uh, are basically localized and integrated forms of permaculture and agroforestry. So this is just to show again that uh, during the year, the photosynthesis basically always has its biggest power in, um, in the tropics um, and some months not at all in the northern hemisphere because of winters. Um, and another one I think is good to see, sorry, it, it's good to see that water vapor, which is the largest greenhouse gas and basically is the cooling and, and warming fluid of our planet, um, uh, it moves through uh, ma mainly the tropics. Um, normally, it, this is a gift that starts running, but it doesn't. But let me just go on. So, in order to turn the situation around, and um, we are in code red, and we are actually much more in code red than most people think, because living systems they stay in balance for a long time when they're under stress, and sometimes they simply break down, and we close. Okay, a regenerative revolution on a world scale, paying millions of people, especially in the global south, to regenerate their land, create a digital architecture for global regeneration. And this is where the, uh, the NFTs and the blockchains come in. And of course, uh, we need to have a huge coalition. And there, I can tell you one thing that's very nice. I've, I've organized um, a round table for um, tokenizers for nature around the Amazon. And already there, we found 12 projects. Uh, so Cardano is doing wonderful, uh, wonderful things. Uh, Very Tree is doing wonderful things, but I, I think the, the number of startups is, it might, might be already crossing the hundred around the world. So let's see. And I don't think we need uh, to, um, to choose for one or the other. I think we need an ecosystem of many of them, as long as they know how to communicate. The whole, whole operation will cost something between one and two percent of global GDP, which is the same amount of money that's that's being paid to fossil fuels and other destructive industries right now. So just turning them around into the right direction would be enough. And it's about 10 percent of the money that was spent by um, uh, by governments to uh, avert the melt, the financial meltdown in 2008. So you wonder how much it uh, is worth to save the planet. What do we get in turn? In return? Okay, we think that if we do this at the size and the scale and the speed with um, technology such as a blockchain under it and, and, and NFTs, we can, uh, we can get uh, um, global temperature down for the first time around 2050. Provided the economy starts decarbonizing, the, econ and the energy transition is on course, etc. I mean, all these things have to go on, but this is an extra feature that needs to be front loaded in the whole process to get us out of the, the mess. Really. It actually will bring a lot of money from the global north to the global south, which is very much necessary because in many ways, uh, the, we, we, the wealthy people of the north, uh, are basically wealthy because of a large and complicated uh, process of extraction of nature and labor in, uh, in, in low paid countries. It will increase water and food security. It will regenerate around the world uh, biodiversity, which is uh, collapsing right now also. And uh, most of all the uh, and, uh, SNGs, uh, SDGs will be improved. So where does uh, the, 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 the digital stuff come in. Um, I propose a di digital architecture for global uh, regeneration that has a couple of elements. Uh, the first one is, um, we call it Open Future because it actually already exists as a platform. It's just being in alpha, uh, in alpha version released. I would call it the Facebook of regenerators where we upload all the organizations and people busy to regenerate into um, a platform where they can communicate with each other, but on very specific and elaborate profiles. So it's easy to find 
partnerships between finance and expertise and projects on the ground. The second one is the Arara app or the Uber of regeneration. Um, that's the Uber of re regeneration basically works with the GPS and everybody with a car can uh, upload their car uh, uh, with, well, there's some rules there, but they can upload their car and start driving and making money. And Uber takes uh, an unfair share of that. Uh, in this case, we want to take a fair share, uh, a few percent maybe, basically anybody with, we, we, we first, we tokenize we, the whole world into, we, we cut them up into uh, NFTs. I was thinking hectares, somebody proposed to me uh, hexagons because it would look more like a beehive. I don't know if that's technically easy, but, but you can see that the whole world suddenly we become a digital um, beehive. And that's a sort of an ownership layer on top of the existing ownership layer. So it doesn't really matter if somebody owns the land. If they just say, I'm going to make this a nice place, then they're in the system and they can start uh, regenerating that. And um, you can do right now, uh, I saw very tree the, 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 the ways they do uh, verification. Uh, that's uh, that's that's de definitely a part of the solution. But more and more, we'll see that um, verification will go straight through satellites um, with a bit of uh, less and less. It's more a randomized form of, of um, uh, looking with forms like a fairy tree in it. <coughs> so then you can actually calculate on any hectare in the world what is happening there in terms of um, regeneration. And you can award the uh, carbon credits that go with that to the owner or the, the one that has the contract, the NFT contract, um, in an automated way. So in this, and then you can scale it. Now, as you know, that we were, our exhaust uh, right now is about uh, 36 gigatons of uh, CO2. Um, let's say we could um, catch half of that by forests and we'll get the extra cooling capacity with it that I was talking about. That means that current price is uh, for the voluntary carbon market, that is uh, 180 uh, a billion dollars per year. That's already waiting to go to those NFTs. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the, the global and local earth currency. I think we need to shift away from um, the current um, country-based uh, currencies and uh, we'll start um, at once this regenerating economy is large enough, uh, issue our own currencies, uh, which are basically localized, but uh, inter-exchangeable with, uh, with uh, other regions. Uh, maybe we should uh, think about bioregions as the basis for local currencies. Um, I'll leave the, the, the community decision-making processes here, but you know that it's possible with, uh, with DAOs and smart uh, contracts on blockchain that you can do a decision making processes and then um, uh, put them on blockchain so that they will be self executed once decisions go over timeline. I myself right now I'm working with a, with a, with a pilot project uh, which is a uh, uh, 1 million um, acres or 400,000 hectare project in uh, the state of Maranhão in Brazil. Um, and uh, we do that with, uh, with the leadership of the Guajajara people who live there. Uh, about half the territory has been uh, destroyed by fire and illegal logging. And uh, several of them have, um, um, have been killed in the process of defending their land. And um, so we're going to turn this around at scale. Um, Eden Projects um, is the largest um, reforested in the world, has already um, signed an MOU with them to uh, provide for the funds Basically, they pay people to plant trees. It's that simple. There's some money from large uh, uh, guys and girls behind it. I, the World Economic Forum, the World Wildlife um, Forum, and I heard the Jeff Bezos Fund has also put some money in there. So basically, they pay people to, uh, to replant and protect. Uh, the deal that we are going to make is most likely with something similar to Very Tree uh, Open Forest Protocol. I don't know, Duncan, if you know that, but uh, anyway, there is a, uh, an, an, I think they are good uh, brothers and sister project of yours. It would be nice uh, to get to know each other. And uh, we will um, 
we will start this Arara app, which basically is this combination of all the villages that are in there will be digitalized, will have connection to um, uh, to satellite um, um, internet, and and they will upload the land they want to protect, and then harvest the uh, payment for eco services from that land while doing their projects. Okay, the timeline right now that we have is uh, we want to start kickoff at, uh, in June 22 in Stockholm. That's the, uh, you have the Stockholm 50 uh, conference is the UN conference 50 years after the first environmental conference of the United States, uh, of the United Nations, sorry. And um, we want to present uh, the case for cooling, uh, that forests actually cool a lot more than everybody thinks and that we can actually cool the planet by uh, regenerating nature. Uh, to um, present that in Egypt. And uh, we are currently um, bringing a coalition together, including a lot of partners that are busy with uh, NFTs and with blockchain techniques to protect nature, um, to kick off a lot of um, projects uh, once um, the terrible government that is currently in Brazil, hopefully will step out uh, on, the second, on the 1st of uh, January, 2023. So this is my, uh, my perspective, a uh, long way from Canada, doing my own little thing in my own little corner of the world. And I thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you so oh. much. Wow, Rob, thank you. Um, thank you for being here and not feeling great and stuff like that, great connection and a lot of interesting pieces of information. And I think we're gonna make some amazing connections with you, with my friend Dawn from locally here, um, Doobie with the NFTs. I, I have a feeling that you're probably, um, your brain is going and figuring I out actually, different solutions. I actually, I actually really wanna see uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a um, conversation between the, uh, the projects and you know how, for example, uh, another very true campaign could be done somewhere uh, in in uh, in the rainforest, uh, and you know how the biodiversity would be uh, you know considered because uh, that's interesting, right? I mean, we we, we know about uh, the palm trees and stuff like that uh, that are uh, being uh, artificially planted and it just doesn't work. So it need, there needs to be the right level of diversity. Um, and I hope that you know in, in what we're doing with with Veritree and other projects, we you know we always think about that because uh, it's interesting. You know, the, the the world is so diverse. We've got so many different places with different needs for trees. Um, but uh, so I'm just I'm just wondering as you bring that up, how can we uh, facilitate a collaboration? Uh, how can in the future, in the near future, as an action plan, facilitate? Uh, you guys make sure you connect. Number one. And if there's any way, Rob and Dawn and, and Doobie, any time that you want to do any of these collaborations and work this together, help us know about it and help us facilitate it. Because this is why we're here, is to start making these connections and to, to get us from being all isolated all over the world, doing our own little thing, creating our own wheels, when we can actually be making this massive wheel and actually making a difference your project about connecting people is really incredible. Um, so thank you, Doobie, for dropping in um, your link. And I don't know if you have your Discord on there as well. That'd be great, um, Doobie, so that people can get in, in, um, in with you there. Have we got Jem back in? It looks like he was locked out for a bit. Maybe he needs a direct link. Yeah, and, and I think just one thing about until you enter, Jacob tried to make him enter. I think uh, Rob is challenging the technology world to find solution for the world project, right? <laughs> so technology mm -hmm. have to come and support and finance, and uh, it's a red, uh, red uh, situation. And uh, yeah, and, and I think technology is there today. We just need now to centralize the efforts, bring the, all the experts and and do it. So definitely we'd love to continue the discussion uh, with Cardano. And uh, this video is recorded, so it will get also to all the right people um, internally. If, if I can make just one small um, uh, remark, Joram. Yes, I think all this, what is happening here is absolutely helpful. And yes, I, I will just put in a link 
uh, the, the pitch deck of the uh, platform where I think we should all be uploaded and start connecting to each other. Um, but uh, the most important thing I think with all the timelines is that I see that people think from here into the future. I think we should make a hard stop in 2030 and see where we are at in order to win this race and then work back. Then we get the ambitions right. About, about the collaboration. I think, thank you, first of all, Rob, for an amazing presentation. I, I think you raised the point that there's a, there's hundreds of projects now starting up, including RS Tridano. Um, there's mature ones like Veritree that have been at this for a long time. Um, there's more on-chain focused ones um, that are focusing on, um, you know, NFTs on the chain. We're trying to bridge that gap between real fi and connecting to real trees. But I think there's a ton of overlap. And, um, our, we don't want to compete. We don't want to like compete for attention, for investment, for, and, you know, I think part of the Cardano uh, way of doing things, and especially within Cardano for Climate, is to collaborate. So I've already started discussions with Duncan from Veritree and with, um, <coughs> with the Cardano Trees folks to figure out where we overlap. And, um, you know, we're all we're going to be better um, working together um, on this as a, as a, you know, as a community, in my opinion. Um, you know, at the end of the day, projects will have some competing interests, perhaps, and that's okay too. Like maybe that'll motivate people to work harder and smarter, and that's not always a bad thing. Um, but uh, anyway, I just want to throw it out there that, and so Melanie asked, what could we do? Um, you know, we could um, look at a future meeting where uh, we, again, we could do this informally, we could do it formally, but I would just encourage anybody else from other projects to reach out to us at Trinano and figure out how, if you already have something that's working, um, you, you know, we gave a kind of an overview of our technical architecture and our concept. Um, if you've got pieces that overlap, uh, come talk to us and we'll figure out that perhaps maybe we don't have to duplicate and we can uh, we can actually have a mutual beneficial relationship. Absolutely, let's build software once and share it. Open yeah, source. Yeah, I think maybe, uh, I wasn't 100% clear, like we were, you know, we're. To dedicate it to 100% free and open source and Creative Commons of our of our documentation material. That's that's my background. I've been doing that for the last 15 years. I've been releasing free open source software and nothing very comfortable working in that environment. Um, so that is yeah, that is something I am kind of I I discourage when I've looked for partners to work with. If they have proprietary software that we can't leverage and reuse or have restrictive licenses, then that makes it a little more difficult to do what we want to do. So that's an important point. Thanks, Jacob. And Jam is back. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry about that. I don't know how it happened in the Zoom. Uh, uh, the meeting was locked, and I hope we didn't yeah. uh, kick any keep anybody else out. I guess we did become a little bit exclusive for a while, and certainly yeah. not you, Jem. Um, for those of you that don't know, is heading up our uh, the Cardano for Climate initiative. He's one of our core team members, and he's going into something called little fish foundation Yoram, will you be able to share the slides yeah um, um, little fish foundation and it's um called a dao for those of you that are not familiar with blockchain lingo it's a decentralized autonomous organization where we can come away from and figure out how we can do better than our centralized governments and the organizations that tend to fail us jim you're up thank you so much for yeah. being here thank you Thank you, Melanie. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Jim, one of the founders of Little Fish Foundation. Uh, Little Fish Foundation is a community initiative for uh, Cardano for Climate, and uh, EDA inspired by Kiva, Kickstarter, and Patreon. We build open source technologies to fund SDG activities. Our aim is to make the funding process transparent, community-driven, and trust-based. Next slide, please. This image represents the allegory of the cave. Uh, most of you know it already. Socrates imagines a cave where prisoners are chained, chained looking at the blank wall. Behind the pris prisoners, a fire reflects shadows onto the walls, creating an imaginary world of shadows. The prisoners believe it is the real world and don't believe those who see the outside those to keep. So, how is this relevant to the challenges we face in the 21st century? One of one in five persons in developing regions living less than a dollar a day. The number of children living in conflict zones has increased. 
wildlife population sizes have dropped by two thirds since the 70s. Nearly 40% of the plants are at risk of extinction. Global emissions of carbon dioxide have increased almost 50% since the 90s. Our institutions seem to address these issues, but they are misleading us. The problem remains unsolved. We are the prisoners in the cave. Next slide, please. Thank you, Kira. Our governments are influenced by the special interest groups like fossil fuel industry and the military industrial complex. Intergovernmental organizations are weak, ineffective, and dominated by superpowers. Meanwhile, most NGOs don't have the scale or the power to drive the real change against the power of these special interests. These organizations all suffer from the same issues. They lack transparency, inclusiveness, and accountability. We don't know how they spend their money. We can't part participate freely, and we can't verify their actions. Next slide, please. Little Fish coming. Ecosystem. Yeah, thank you. Little Fish Ecosystem includes activists, entrepreneurs, donators, stakers, artists, and stakeholders. The vision is to create a sustainable funding ecosystem that brings these actors together. We design an ecosystem that rewards all participants while removing the men in the middle. Activists and entrepreneurs are the drivers of the change in the ecosystem. They plant trees, organize protests, start eco-friendly businesses, and solve problems within their communities. They provide the time and the effort, but need funding. Other parties provide funding. Supporters donate directly to the pro projects of their preference. Stakers share a percentage of their earnings by staking through partner SPOs. Artists provide their NFT art to generate additional funding. We have a big vision to implement, but how do we start? We start, we start small and we learn by doing. So right from the start, we wanted to fund activism projects to learn. Thus, we initiated the first donation cycle where we got six proposals in 10 days and collected 1,000 data thanks to our community, community and partners. We held voting open to community members and completed the fund transfer this week. Our winner, fittingly, is a project that aims to turn a patch of deforested land into a forest once again. Over the next month, the proposer of the project will present evidence of their activities, a proof of activity, as we call it. We hope to collect such proofs on chain and on an impact ledger to provide accountability. Next slide, please. It is the very early days of Little Fish, but there are already extensive support from the community. We need people who will help turn this vision into a re reality. We need copywriters and community builders. We need artists to inspire us for a better future. We need all sorts of curious individuals to make it happen. In short, we need to free some prisoners become a little fish today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jim. Thank you. Very beautiful. Uh, so Melania. next up is Dawn. Uh, and Dawn is um, on Wi-Fi that may be a little bit sketchy. We're also running a little bit short. Um, if you could go through the slides, please, Yoram. Um, and Don, if you are here and able to chat, I'm here. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, good. So if you just okay. want to uh, back up one slide there, and let's give Don if you could about five I'll, ten minutes at the most. Yeah. I'll 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 go really really fast. Uh, first of all, thanks. Uh, for having me and uh, I've really been inspired by the presentations and I would like to thank all of you for doing this important local and planetary work it's uh, it's super important and uh, you know with any luck at all maybe we can add some value to what you're doing um, we're definitely taking 
a different perspective, but I think uh, the perspective that we're taking with our work um, is going to be very connected and very heart-centered with your own. So the Wildcraft Forest has uh, been working uh, with boots on the, pro boots on the ground uh, projects now for about 20 years. Um, we, are, we take a, a, a spiritual approach to, to stewardship. And um, as the slide shows, uh, when we invest in the forest, she invests in us and the currency is life force. So uh, we really believe this. Um, what we do is not for everyone. Uh, we, I, I guess you could say that um, we might represent maybe 10% of the population as far as a perspective. That is, um, I really feel good around trees, but I know that trees talk to me and I can talk back to them. We're those people. And uh, so, so with this currency of life force, um, we know that if we invest in the forest, it's not economically driven, it is spiritually driven. And, um, and that currency is all about procreation. So the more that we can put back into the forest to regenerate a forest, uh, the more that that forest will connect with us and bring us actual better health. So, uh, you know, actually over 20 years ago, we started developing systems whereby uh, products and uh, systems could be um, uh, developed from a wild forest uh, that could create more economic values and more experience values than a dead, dead forest. And uh, a couple of years back, we actually reached the point where we could prove that we could generate uh, more funding from uh, a living forest than, uh, than a forest company could by cutting dimensional lumber. Uh, in that in that respect, we actually become a threat to the system. So uh, right now we create uh, we create different things in the forms of teas and medicines and other products. Uh, they all have the element of stewardship, and um, and I have to I have to really emphasize this is not agroforestry that we're doing, nor is it agriculture in any way. It's not permaculture, because what we are supporting in the form of stewardship are wild, wild, wild species that should be in a, a, a primeval forest that don't necessarily give us any direct values. And so we do this, we, we support forests so that the biodiversity can happen. So there's many other species out there that gain values from, from uh, plant and tree species where we don't receive necessarily any values. So, so we support um, uh, this sort of an approach. So in this, um, in this process, we, um, we created a school and uh, that school teaches uh, the values that we promote in the form of the spiritual stewardship. And um, since we got this going a number of years ago, we're now in 30 countries. So we have uh, many different people around the planet developing what we call sanctuary forests. And the sanctuary forests become uh, temples, so to speak, and, but they also provide a platform whereby people can do the type of stewardship that we, uh, that we outline. Uh, next slide, please. Am I making sense, everybody? Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're making a lot of connections. Um, there's already asks in the chat. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. There's asks in the chat how to um, get your program in Europe. And uh, uh, well, yeah. we have we have our program in Europe. If you go to uh, wildcraftforest.com, uh, that's one of our websites, and our school website is from that platform. And uh, you can see what we we teach everything from bioregionalism to forest therapy. Uh, to our sanctuary forest models and so on. So we, we run these as certification programs, at least many of these programs, and um, uh, with the idea that you can actually create an enterprise where you're teaching, uh, demonstrating, and, uh, and actually making, making a living from a living forest, which is super important. Now in Canada here, um, we have a secret plan. And our secret plan is 
is if we can, if we can uh, keep going with a bona fide method of teaching spiritual stewardship, and we can logically within a legal framework explain that a forest is a temple for that, for that stewardship, we can protect forests through the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We have a, we have a, a legal team that works with us uh, on, that, on that approach. So that's our long-term plan. So, um, so exactly, you know, how do we restore places? Well, um, our approach to uh, planting trees is more than just planting trees. We, we take areas and we, we, we plant whole forests. And the areas that we work in here are headwaters areas, source areas for both the Fraser River and the Columbia River. And we believe that what we do at the sources of these areas actually impact the, uh, the, the tributaries and the rivers right down to the estuary in the ocean. So, the, you know, these areas that we work in are, are uh, central to the inland temperate rainforest, which provides more fresh water into the Pacific than any other river system in the Americas. So, so we believe spiritually, and you know, the science will follow, and it already is to a degree, but we believe spiritually what we do at these headwaters impacts this entire, entire uh, waterway. <clears throat> so what do we do out here? Well, we do, we, we, we work remotely. Uh, we, we move into industrialized uh, clear-cut areas and we go and we uh, protect and we uh, extend old growth areas. So in British Columbia here, and it's not too different than other uh, in other areas, the riparian areas along waterways um, are protected zones. So, so forest companies can only go so far. And uh, that's where your old growth areas are. When forest companies go and create their clear cuts, they put roads in and they put culverts in, and those culverts drain water um, out of those um, out of those clear cut areas, uh, create an incredible mess, and cause slides that go into the waterways. What's missing is uh, for entities to come along like ourselves, and to actually plant riparian areas in those culvert areas. So those culvert draining areas, what we do is we restore the soils, we plant understory, and we plant native species so that we create a, a new riparian corridor right down into the existing uh, riparian area. So we do this um, bit by bit, we do it covertly, we wait until the forest companies have planted their industrial forests and then we go in with genetically natural species. So we go out and we collect, we collect the, uh, the seeds from old growth areas, we collect the soils from old growth areas, and then we restore those uh, and create new ones if need be, uh, uh, those drainage systems. So, you know, again, the plan then is, is once, those, once those new riparian areas are seeded, come 30 or 40 years, as they mature, they will be considered a, a, a riparian area that is has to be legally protected. So, so when you look at if you if you take an aerial view of these areas, what you will see is you will see old growth corridors that are are then expanded. There, that is riparian areas that are expanded, and then new. Uh, new corridors that are feeding those corridors. So what we're seeing then over time, and again, we're taking a long view on this, uh, you know, in, in, in 300 years, you would have uh, an ever expanding old growth continuous forest that was not there before. So, so what we've done in, uh, you know, we're always, we do this covertly. We're not, uh, you know, uh, you know, we're not really liked by forest companies, but, you know, at the end of the day, as they transition, um, they'll come to understand that we're on the, on the, uh, on the right page. Uh, so uh, we've started a, a carbon offset or a conservation offset 
it's uh, it's very regional, but you know, uh, I mean, we welcome participation uh, internationally. But um, the idea is that is that is that we would raise the funds uh, further to what we are raising already to help us expand these efforts. We call them green earth offsets. And um, the measurement around these offsets, you know, and, and, and again, I need to emphasize we're planting whole forests and not just trees. It's super, super important to understand that what we need on this planet are whole wild forests. And that, that requires that we get real busy to plant the understory species along with the trees. And in some cases, uh, some trees are needed for biodiversity specifically, and you have to be around enough. That you, have to, you have to really get to know these areas to understand what trees are required. So we don't take an industrial approach uh, to, uh, to the regeneration of, of wild areas. We take a very localized and, again, a spiritual approach that is based in, on stewardship. We measure our offsets based on soil. So we create biochar and we dig that biochar into these areas that we're working on to prepare these, what's, what's often very, very damaged soil. And, uh, and then we plant the understories and then the trees on top of those, on, on top of those treated story, uh, soils. We inoculate those soils with soils from old growth areas because we believe that the soil carries a memory so that it can support the, uh, the, these, uh, these new riparian areas as they grow. So, so in short, um, and, in, and in closing, I guess, is that uh, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're exploring now um, uh, the world of NFTs and so on to, uh, to help support our efforts. And um, we're, we're really eager for uh, collaboration as well. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Yoram, would you mind just next slide? Um, I don't know that Don can actually see the slides. Maybe he can, but- oh, yeah, um, I, can, oh. I can see the slides okay. and I forgot that, yeah. forgot that last That's okay. I've been, I've been trying to just back up one slide and I did drop the links to Don in the chat. Um, so if you want to uh, connect with him. Great. Um, yeah, there's Don, you're going to be a big part of this. I don't know, um, you know, how much time you have for us, but I feel like you're going to be what we're going to, we're going to um, need your knowledge a lot. Well, my challenge always is Melanie. And as you know, this is that, uh, you know, once the snow clears, we're actually, like I said, we're boots on the ground and we're actually out on the land uh, there. And, uh, and we're in remote areas, so it's very, very hard to reach us. And so um, if, if, if anybody want, does want to collaborate and um, if they're wanting to know more about what we do, now's the time, uh, you know, January, February, March, and then after March, we're, we're out there. Perfect. Good, good, um, good to know uh, your timeline. Okay, moving on, uh, we do have breakout rooms scheduled for after this. Um, please feel free to stay longer if you have time. We're in the call to action. Jacob, your turn. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, we've been thinking uh, about something that we can uh, all relate to. And uh, there is actually something tangible we can do. You know, there is this, we can, we want to ask you to count something for us. Um, and uh, it, it all depends on um, uh, on the next slide, really, and uh, the fact that you need to go and uh, check uh, what's... I'll, I'll, I'll take the segue into this story, Jacob. I forgot this one was here first. Um, uh -huh. at, at Fairy Creek, Creek as uh, Rob mentioned, it's uh, one of the ancient rainforests on the west coast of BC, and it is being under attack. Uh, people are being pepper sprayed in order to prep, uh, protect it. The uh, police force is arresting people. People are going to jail. Uh, no, I don't know about jail, but they are, they are being arrested uh, in order to protect our forests. And what happens in BC um, is that 52% of 
uh, forest product is turned into fiber. Um, Teal Jones is the one that uh, we're, we're uh, up against in Ferry Creek. They're not the only one. There is a link to an article here that um, describes how that is. So our challenge for you today is to actually think about uh, your paper products and where they come from. And in doing that, we're also going to create this market demand for supply chain. We want to know where our products come from. When I first heard that um, toilet paper could come from big old trees, I was shocked. I couldn't even believe it. So we need to actually ask. Next slide, please, Yoram. So our challenge is to, for you to check the label on your toilet paper and ask where it comes from. How many kilometers away is it? And where was it produced? This, um, this um, hashtag, thanks to Jacob, we didn't end up cha uh, changing it. Uh, maybe you can explain how we can use a hashtag. Um, I'm not sure if we should use this hashtag actually, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the idea is that uh, this is something we all can do, you know, uh, pretty much everybody in the world, well, in the world that's, you know, they actually use this to toilet paper because uh, a big portion of the world uh, has different methods which we are uh, not familiar with and, and uh, actually which prove to be more uh, sanitary and, and uh, environmentally friendly. Um, so yeah, you know we can uh, we can relate to that, and we can track that. We can uh, uh, see where you know where we're consuming, and you know the, the the paper is is a product. Product needs to travel, so there is you know footprint on on that as well. Uh, and if your products are made in China, go go and come. Well, down. I have I I purchase toilet paper uh, made out of bamboo, and it comes from China, which also has an impact, a travel impact. And I'm thinking, why can't we uh, create toilet paper from bamboo here, hemp, anything? There's got to be other options. But I think that as a market, if we start asking, and, and Cedar Jones, for example, they create cedar shakes and lattice from their products, but they're cutting down 800-year-old trees to make these cedar. And if you look at the uh, upper picture, you can see how these primary forests are being threatened because the clear cutting is getting closer and closer. So we definitely have to think differently and eight years uh, until 2030 means eight years of clear cutting unless we start uh, something now. We cannot afford uh, with the mechanization that they have and how fast trees move off the forest, we do not have time to wait. So this is our challenge and um, our next challenge has to do with our project catalyst. Yoram's going to talk about uh, how we have, uh, who we yeah. are, Cardano for climate. Yeah, I think again, I would be very short. So I think, in this sense, I mean, um, first of all, amazing. Thank you very much to everyone. I mean, it has so much content and so many people. And thank you very much for everyone and very inspiring. So Cardano for Climate mission is how, really how can we uh, impact the blockchain of Cardano to focus also on climate change. And we see it a huge opportunity. Uh, two models are going to change in the next 10 years, one related to blockchain and second related to climate change. And if we can combine them, we, it's a massive opportunity for, 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 for everyone. Uh, so this is already our mission. We started a few months ago, already over 200 people, tens of projects in Project Catalyst. So this is a decentralized incubator, uh, basically uh, in a simple ways for, out, uh, for people from outside. And we basically some showcase in here and everyone will have the presentation. We showcase some of the, uh, with link, some of the different a proposal related to climate change that are coming for the next fund. So there is fund cycles every 12 weeks. The next one starts in two weeks. Um, um, so that it's a new cycle, but the cycle that started, that one cycle finished now, so the voting starts actually today for all of these proposals. So if you have ADA and you're part of the community and register to vote, we kind of centralize for you all the voting in one place for the, for the key slides. Yoram, I've got a question here because of course, um, our projects, if we could stay on the slide for just a second, uh, the previous. Yeah. Um, 
because our projects, you know, uh, we've been uh, working on, on on our proposals and fine tuning them and uh, uh, having them assessed and and uh, uh, you know also campaigning to 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 get the funds we needed. Uh, we we asked for um, and I think um, for example, you know, uh, in the mammoth mammoth project uh, project that I submitted uh, requested thirty three thousand um, dollars, which is more than for example uh, Little Fish Foundation. Um, and I just wanted to check, you know, what's what's the best thing to do? Because uh, I, at this point, you know, I uh, uh, I'm I'm talking to uh, to Chem, and we're we're actually um, on board that we, we want to do this together. So um, I'm gonna basically give give my vote. You know, anything that comes to 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 Woolly Mammoth to uh, to Little Fish, uh, and I think this is the right way to start it. Um, and I'm thinking that you know, if one project has more more funds than the other, maybe it makes sense to um, to coordinate that. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's a very deep question, and I think coordination between um, projects is something very interesting uh, to do. It's something that we can suggest, but I think it's a deep discussion. Overall, what 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 we try to do here is make it easy for voters, right? So we put all the if they're interested in impact, if they're interested in climate change, they can find everything in one place. And this is what they, and, and obviously through the process we are trying, as all of you know, uh, that made proposal to help the proposals, to make sure the proposals are good, make sure they're getting funded. But we think much larger than that, right? And how can we help them scale and take it to the next level? Uh, but this is really the, the stage we are now is, you know, if you have ADA, if you are part of the community, you register to vote, so is, uh, use these slides um, to go and vote for these uh, proposals. And if you not yet there and you have ideas, so a new fund starts in two weeks and we'll be very help, um, happy to help you realize your project and make sure you are getting funded in the next uh, cycle, which starts now, which is going to be a major one. It's a $16 million cycle. And, and but but I love your idea again. I, I think it's something that we can propose to Catalyst if if someone getting vote can transfer vote to someone else or collaboration. No, but I'm, definitely what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying what I'm saying is that you know it's slightly imperfect because you know um, I know that Little Fish has a, a team, massive team behind it already, and yeah. have done a lot of work, and they're they're gonna get the less budget than if I would get my my budget. That's what I'm saying, and I'm I'm the only guy. I just started you know, with an idea two weeks ago, so I'm nowhere close to uh, the setup. And so, you know, I, and I just want to say it's a waste uh, not to give them more more funds. Yeah, but this this is part of the spirit of Catalyst and what we are trying to do. So how you know the, we have objectives to to get results, right? Not to get funded. The objective is to get results, to progress, to, to change the world basically. And Absolutely. I love this spirit. I'm just saying, you know, having seen the roadmap that's uh, that's uh, James presented, you know, that there's so much uh, to to be built in, in little. It's amazing. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna know more of yeah. this in the future, Jacob. You know, the collaboration part, the connection part, has really been missing, and having Cardano for climate a challenge setting, we can be in one place, and <laughs> start working towards our, this collaboratively. There's nothing wrong with you doing your proposal. I would suggest if you wanted to go in idea scale, you could put in a comment and just say, you know, I've been watching Little Fo uh, Fish Foundation and the, the plan that they're doing is absolutely incredible and I fully support it. And in that voters could see where you are and that, you know, you're working to collaborate too. So, yeah. That's a good idea, thank you. Yeah, yeah. you're welcome. So we're at the end of our two hours, a little bit over, and I really appreciate everybody that came. Okay, so Jacob is putting the pressure on me to say thank you all for coming to this event. Um, our second iteration in Cardano for Climate, one day we'll figure out a new title. We'll get these, these things all right. But what I believe perfection is right now is um, what we're doing. We are perfect when we're collaborating. And I feel very strongly that we're going to see some really amazing things coming up in 2022. So thank you all for coming and um, let's get this done. <laughs>